You only get one chance at batting, so you've got to be prepared. You've got to have thought of how you're going to handle it, what the bowlers are trying to do. I was a tall guy, I was mainly a front foot player. I was always positive and attacked the bowling. I think people make a big mistake today. Certainly batsmen, they're too defensive. They think batting is about all not getting out. You've got to turn the tide and put the bowlers under pressure, and that was my intention. The only person who could literally decimate an attack, destroy it. People were frightened to bowl at him. And he's walloped it again, it's going down to the mid-wicket boundary, and it's another four. Graham Pollock was just a magnificent player, you, you, you know, you're not going to see better. Graham was uh, an incredible batsman. He was a ruthless player, who uh, struck a ball harder than anybody in our area. He was, in my opinion, one of the top four or five batsmen that the world's ever seen. Tall man, wide stance, loved the front foot, and he drove the ball with an immense power. When you bowled a bad ball to Graham, he hit it for four. He didn't hit it at a fielder, he, he hit it for four. Graham Pollock's played some knocks that, you know, I, d I doubt anybody that's ever lived could play as well. He was what I call a genius. Everything came naturally to him. He didn't have to even practice. He was special, a real special player. Thus the South African player of the century. He came to Port Elizabeth in 1950-odd. His father was the editor of a newspaper called The Friend in Bloemfontein. And he transferred to Port Elizabeth where he became the editor of the local Eastern Province Herald. And Graham was a little boy of five. Yeah, I played in my early cricket in Port Elizabeth. Um, probably the story goes around four, five, six years old. My mum, probably when we were four years old, used to do the job of, of playing cricket and, and it goes that uh, I used to stand left-handed and then she thought, no, that was all wrong. So I went up to heaven and I said, no, darling, this is the way to bat. You hold the bat in your right hand like this and you bat like this. Now, I, you stand there and I'll go and bowl to you. So I walked away and I turned round to bowl. And, and uh, I would then go back to left-handed and uh, I think... You know, she probably realised then that uh, I was left-handed. I said, good heavens, his father's a left-hand bat, this child's a left-hand bat. His formative years were spent at the Grey School in Port Elizabeth, where the young Graham Pollock's skill was spotted early. It was a cricketing school and we used to have an English professional come out every year. Tom Dean from uh, Hampshire was the coach at the Grey at, at the time Graham was here. And I said, Tom, what are you doing with this guy? That he's so, so brilliant. He said, Jeff, you can't teach him anything. He's got flaws, but his eye is so good. It doesn't matter whether his leg is out of position slightly and there's a gap between bat and pad, nothing will get through. He just hits it. I just was fanatical cricketer from day one. And luckily my brother also played South African cricket and he was two years older. So always there was someone to play cricket. He lived in Mill Park in Burton Road, which was just round from Linton Road where I lived. My brother and I played cricket across the road and it, in the evenings when Graham and Peter Pollock were walking home, they'd stop and field for us. Jeff, in fact, was a, probably about 500 yards down the road and we used to walk home from school and Jeff was probably eight years older and he was a good cricketer and uh, we used to have to go and bolt him. I got to know him then as that tiny little chap 
And they developed into these two marvelous cricketers, Peter the Fast Bowler and Graham, this incredible cricketer, incredible batsman. Graham and elder brother Peter would both go on to realize their dreams. And unusually, it was the younger sibling who was the inspiration. He just felt that, he, he just knew that he was going to play for Saifka one day. And I thought, well, as the elder brother, I've just got to play for Saifka earlier than he does. Those early years saw Pollock model himself on one of the finest batsmen of his generation. I was a big follower of Australian cricket. There was a left-hander called Neil Harvey in the 50s, and he made a lot of runs specifically against South Africa. And uh, I followed him. The youngster was soon emulating his hero, his prolific run scoring for Grey School, serving notice of his incredible talent. His development was such that he represented Eastern Province when still only 16. I was his captain when he came into the side. One of the first matches we played against was Border. And he got 50 and I thought I'd better nurse him a bit. Didn't need any nursing. He nursed me. It was a fantastic time period and Jeff, as a youngster, to go along with him, it was great. The same season saw him become the youngest player in South African history to score a first-class century. I was doing well and uh, I enjoyed it. I played my first provincial game was 16 years old and then the South African side was going to Australia in 1963 as a 19-year-old and I got it. I had a good season and, and was chosen in the, the tour to Aussie in 1963. Despite his enormous talent, the teenager struggled to make an impact early on. In the first two test matches, he failed in each, on each occasion. And I'll always remember that Bobby Simpson, who I was very friendly with, said, um, you know, this youngster that you tell me is so good, I think he's a little bit overrated. And I said, just hang on a minute, there's still three test matches to go. And I think that Bobby was quite convinced by the end of the fifth test that he wasn't so overrated. I hadn't made runs in the first two tests, and it was nice to recover and get 100 in the third test in Sydney. And then I got a 175 in Adelaide in the fourth test. So it, it worked out uh, okay. These 175 that he made in Adelaide that Don Bradman watched said it was the best innings he'd ever seen by a left-hand batsman. 1965 saw Pollock's first visit to England. And in the second test, the South Africans were on the ropes. The first innings were in terrible trouble. I can't remember the exact figures. And I remember we were, when I went down to bat, we were 10 for 2 and then we were 40 for 4. And the ball was going around a little bit. I played Tom Cartwright, he came out in the previous year, 1964. And the conditions are in South Africa pretty different. So he, he wasn't all successful in South Africa. So I think psychologically when I went in there, he was the guy doing the damage. I, I didn't feel that it was a major problem. So it's Cartwright to Pollock. Lata can't stop that. What a good shot because the ball looks like four. Pollock racked up 125 in just 139 minutes, prompting English legend Dennis Compton to wax lyrical. I, I quite honestly, I think this is perhaps the greatest innings I've ever seen. And when one considers that he's performed like this in such the most wonderful fashion when South Africa were really up against it. Well, that was the Pollock Test victory. I mean, Peter got 10 wickets in the match and Graham got a brilliant hundred. He made difficult conditions as he did in that, in that uh, test match um, at Trent Bridge. He, nobody else could bat. He could. It was a momentous occasion for that team. We were a very young team and we won that series. So I think that was a start of a very successful era for South African cricket. 16 months on, and Bob Simpson's Australians were once again put to the sword by a less than 100% Pollock. I pulled a hamstring, in, in fact, the first day we, we fielded, and then there was a little bit of contention. I, I didn't want to bat, we had to bat for an hour or two to the, the last session on the second day. And I tried to get out of it, telling the captain I wasn't ready to bat. An extra day's rest would have made a big difference. And he said, no, you're going to bat four. And it, Turned out quite nicely in the half hour I batted, I was about 30 or 40 not out. Pollock went on to complete a knock of 209 as he helped South Africa to a first ever series win over the Australians. We were dominant. Uh, and I think for many 
South African test cricketers down the years who had been annihilated by Australia, they took much delight that now the tables had reversed and now we were defeating Australia, but convincingly. Things got even better in 1970. You know, the Australians came to South Africa off the back of a, of a win series against India. Um, so they, they were considered, I think, the best side in, in world cricket at that time. In that 1970 side, we had some wonderful players. Ali Bakha was a superb captain of those guys. That was an outstanding team. I mean, it was a young team. They were supreme confidence that would beat the Australians. We had not good players, we had great players on that side. Probably half the side could be termed great. Eddie Bowler was a, a, an amazing all-rounder. He, he really was very, very good. Bright Proctor, if in any era, he would have been regarded as a great cricketer. Peter Pollock, fast bowler and so on. So you just run through the team. It was strong in all-rounders, but over and above that, there really was a youthful exuberance and a desire to get together, to play together, and to be very successful. It was just a phenomenal side to play in. You know, you look back at that side and everyone just knew what their jobs were. They just did it uh, and then did it very well. We had two of the greatest batsmen the world's ever seen, Barry Richards and Graham Pollock. South Africa won the first test easily. Nine days later at Kingsmead in Durban, the two batting greats were at their best. Barry was first session uh, very contrary to what normally happens. He had 94 at lunchtime. I think I spurred him along because I was the new boy on the block and he, he'd obviously been the, the champion batsman. I was supposedly the, the main player on, in the batting lineup, and this young guy had been around and made huge runs all over the world. And uh, I was probably under a little bit of pressure. It was honestly, um, in my opinion, and I think probably in the opinion of many people, a challenge constantly between Graham and Barry. So Barry did well in an innings, Graham felt that he had to perform. It just worked from, from ball one. I, th I think the most opening shot was a boundary off Alan Connolly and uh, we put on 100 from, in the first hour after lunch and we, I got 50 and he got 50. You're at that end and you, I'm at this end <laughs> and away you go. So um, yeah, uh, always difficult when, when Graham was playing well to get the strike off him. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> He's a very good counter, especially up to six. You know, the sixth ball would be nudged away somewhere where you couldn't refuse a single and you'd stand the other end and watch five balls and then six. You look for a, <laughs> look for a single. Was, and I always said to him, you know, why do you pinch a single? He said, I hate eight runs going to waste by watching the other guy block them. <laughs> Which I always thought, yeah, well, that's fair enough. They were the two greatest batsmen this country has ever produced. Richards technically unbeatable. Barry's only problem was, he was also a genius, he used to get bored batting and give his wicket away. He gave it away at 140 and I decided, well, there's an opportunity. And I just remember my, da my dad had died about two, three weeks earlier and he always said, if you're going to be a good player, you've got to get big scores. It was Ian Chappell who said to Keith Stackpole or someone at second slip when Barry was playing so well and you could see Graham was really concentrating hard and then Barry got out because he'd opened the batter, he went out by 140, I think, and Graham was obviously hit a lot less than that. And Chappelle turned to, to Keith Stackpole and said, Stackers, I think we've got a bit of trouble here. And he said, why? And he said, well, you know, there's an upstart just got 140, and Graham Pollock's not going to take that line down. Watching Graham carry on from Barry, when Barry scored about 140 in that innings, Graham just had to emulate that. And then Graham broke the South African record and made 274. I used to think, well, Barry was the artist. So when Barry got 140 in Durban, he's painted the picture, he'd framed it, and then he, he got out. Graham said, no, thank you. I'm staying in and I'll get my 274. It was just annihilation. You know, it was just a magnificent exhibition of batting. Looking back, I was upset. I pretty much gave it away at 274. And I always would have liked to have had a 300 behind my name in Test cricket. I batted with him for a little bit of that, of that knock. Um, and he, when he got to 274 and got out caught and bowled uh, by Stackpole with a full toss, he was really angry. 
he was greedy for runs. Rather sadly, of course, South Africa was the last country on the African continent to get television, so the game wasn't on television either. You couldn't watch it. You could only sit and listen on the radio, which of course was also exciting to listen to because it was slaughter on Kingsmead. We won comprehensively that uh, series in 1970. It wasn't just the 4-0, but the 4-0 were big, big margins. You know, I think it was two innings defeats and a sort of the other two were in excess of 250, 250 runs. So they were, they were huge margins. Far from being the start of a golden cricket era, the whitewash against Australia was to be the last official test match that Pollock and his teammates would experience. At the bottom of it, I think we all knew because of the system in South Africa as it was, and the world was against South Africa and against the Pollock. The English cricket team had been due to tour South Africa the previous season. And after initially omitting him, England named the Cape Town-born mixed-race batsman Basil D'Oliveira in their touring party. It was a decision which led to South Africa threatening to refuse England entry to the country if they included the player. The team has constituted now is not the team of the MCC. It is the team of the anti-apartheid movement. Following failed negotiations between the two nations' cricket boards, the English cancelled the tour in September 1968. We were under pressure from the world, you know, from the cricket and playing international cricket. Segregation on and off the field had brought matters to a head, and subsequently the South African cricket team were isolated from international competition following the series against Australia. The tragedy was when we were banned in 1970. We were out for 20 years. But the, the decision taken by the international cricket community, I think, was a correct decision by virtue of the fact that South Africa's Achilles heel was indeed its sport. At that stage, we weren't playing against any of the, the non-white countries, as it were. We only played New Zealand, Australia and England. There are many, many players of that era who uh, I feel enormously sorry for. I mean, obviously, um, in a cricketing sense, I mean, the country is a different thing. I mean, you can't compare it with, you know, the things that were going on in the country which transpired. You think for 22 years, Clive Rice and a lot of these, and Barry Richards playing four tests and Pocky playing seven. I mean, these were great cricketers. Graham Pollock was proactive in the fight against apartheid as he was part of a group of players who staged a walk-off during a game at Newlands in 1971 to underline the fact that South African teams should be selected on ability and not skin colour. A game organised by the government, part of the South African Games. It was the rest of South Africa against the winners, which was Transvaal. I was captain and my brother and, and Procky and Dennis Lindsay, we were having supper the one night. And we just decided we've got to do something as players. We decided we weren't going to play the match. And we were talking about it, and I knew Charles Fortune, at that doyen of commentators in South Africa. Charles was in the restaurant, and we said, Charles, you know, what, what do you think of the idea? And he, he was good, and he helped us, assisted in saying, don't up upset the public, the people want to come and watch the game. Bowl of delivery, walk off and make an announcement where you say that uh, merit was the only criteria in picking side from sides. And that's exactly what we did and it had a huge effect. You know, to take on the, the nationalist government or the government in those days, it wasn't easy. You're living in the country, you want to work and you're going to do business in the country. And to criticise them, uh, it, it wasn't easy. I think the walk off at Newlands was, was extremely sincere. Um, I think it was a moral thing, more than a political thing. And I think it was morally correct. Um, but it caused a hell of a rumpus. I think the significance for the players to do that was a good indication of what, how they really felt. By banning and ostracizing South African sport, they got to apartheid big time. And I have no doubt that that was one of the crucial reasons why the demise of apartheid began to take effect at, the, at that time. Not playing for those 22 years was, was probably the right thing because if it, if it changed, if it changed uh, 44 million people's lives, it had to be for the good. Whilst Pollock's international career was over at the age of 26, the 23 tests he had played for his country had underlined his world-class pedigree and ensured hero status in his homeland. No matter how old he gets, or if he's sick or anything, he comes into the field, he just makes the centuries. 
he just goes on. It's brilliant. Would you like to be like him one day? Definitely. Any, 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 any boy would. During South Africa's ban, the only opportunities for a world audience to glimpse his talents came when he turned out against rebel touring sides, which helped to prolong his career well past his 30th birthday. I ended up playing another 10 years till 1987-88. One of Pollock's final outings saw him roll back the years with an appearance against an Australian 11 as Kim Hughes led a rebel touring party. I was injured and I made a point of phoning the convener of selection to say, I want to play in Port Elizabeth. It's my last game and I started my career and I, everything gelled to say, make an effort to play. When he was well into his 40s and he took five Australian fast bowlers that come out on rebel tours, he just took them absolutely apart. Pollock endured a difficult start in Port Elizabeth as he faced Rodney Hogg early on. I started shakily, I didn't, I nearly got out in the first two or three deliveries, Nick one and dropped short of, of slip. And I, I worked my way out of it. One thing about Graham, if you didn't get him early, you were in serious trouble because he would continue to bat for as long as he possibly could. And it was a, it was a hell of a tussle, but Graham played magnificently. It was hard work, I mean, it wasn't my usual innings. I, I batted a, a lot longer than I, I normally did. He completed his century and went on to make a determined 144. People don't realize, they think if you're talented, you just go out in the middle and it all happens, it doesn't. There's a lot of time and effort and worry and uh, concern. They all said, thank God they didn't have to bolt him when, <laughs> when he was 27. Believe me, you just, that was uh, just a, a real memorable uh, innings of his. And just, you know, seeing him do that, and having the pleasure of seeing him do that and uh, watching him bat, we were privileged. It was going to be my last test innings and uh, I just wanted to make it count. Graham Pollock finally called time on his career after 27 years of first-class cricket. His genius was such that he ranks among the greats of the game despite a test career that was cut short in its infancy. His 23 official matches for South Africa yielded well over 2,000 runs with an average of 60.97 and included seven centuries. The best records for, for like, like Graham, who's second of the all-time greats, they only played against the, you know, the McCoy, McCoy teams, very good teams. Um, so we never played against Sri Lanka, West Indies, India, Pakistan for, for obvious reasons. For some, uh, like Graham, uh, it could have been a career, a life. Uh, you know, the professionalism was coming in soon after that. If Graham Pollock had been born 20 or 30 years later, he today would have probably been one of the richest cricketers in the world. The tragedy with him was that with all that brilliance, he never got paid for it. His legacy transcends just facts, figures and money. And he will be remembered as a man who put his countrymen's best interests ahead of his own. By making a stand against apartheid in the troubled times of the 1970s, he and his teammates helped pave the way for a modern South Africa. With his playing days over, Pollock still remained in the game he loved and joined the South African cricket board. A spell in the media followed before he finally retired altogether with half a century of service to cricket behind him. The school is so proud of him because what he did for the grey in terms of uh, putting the grey the grey on the map, uh, it's it, it'd be very difficult to see it repeated in life. Certainly not in my lifetime. There was further recognition from the city of Port Elizabeth in 2013, when the pavilion of St George's Park was renamed. That was fantastic because it was just out of the blue. They honoured him by calling it the Graham Pollock Pavilion, and he came flew down for it, and he's very proud of it. I can't sing his praises really adequately to describe to you what, a, what an incredible cricketer he was. Graham Pollock was named South Africa's Cricketer of the Century in 2000, but the man himself remains as humble as ever. I think if I, I gave some pleasure and they enjoyed watching and uh, playing aggressive cricket and, and scoring boundaries, and I always enjoyed it. and. Uh, 
you know, there was no money involved, but uh, we had wonderful times. You know, we had the great teams and uh, we used to enjoy it. And uh, I had 27 years, which was uh, probably one of the longest careers of any first class cricketer. If someone said to me, you've got, you could have one look at uh, a guy getting 100, be the last innings you'll ever watch in your life. Uh, he'll play the best innings that, uh, that he can. Who would you pick? And I'd pick Graham Pollock.